Bird, 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 bird! Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. This episode is brought to you by the folks from Synovatin. Now, if you've never heard of Synovatin, you're going to hear about it soon. And if you have a dog with elbow osteoarthritis, and that is very common these days in the sporting breeds, you're looking for something that's going to help him get through the season. And that's where Synovatin OA can help. It's a different way to relieve the pain that causes limping and lameness. Just one quick non-surgical treatment can provide pain relief for up to a whole year. So if your dog's elbow pain has been keeping you and him out of the woods and all the things you love to do together, ask your veterinarian about Synovatin OA, or visit activedognow.com slash learn more. This procedure can only be performed by licensed veterinarians at veterinary hospitals permitted to use internal radiation therapy. On rare occasions, discomfort in the treated elbow has been seen in dogs that can last up to 72 hours after treatment. Short-term home care instructions must be followed after treatment to minimize extended close contact, such as co-sleeping. To review the full veterinary prescribing information, visit activedognow.com slash cpinfo. And just so you know, co-sleeping means don't let him sleep in your bed if you get this done. Hey, everybody, it's Ron Bain from the Hunting Dog Podcast. It's Tuesday the 26th. By the time you listen to this, it'll be the 27th. It'll be officially three days late, but I have had a busy, busy, busy week. Um... I'm down in Virginia at Beer Mountain, trying to do some flooring, some painting, some trim, some base. My beloved Beer Mountain is not going to be sold. It's going to be rented out like a vacation rental. And and actually, if you want to come and hunt mountain grouse or come for dove season, once this is listed, you're going to want to stay here. This We've got this thing sweetened up, plus five kennels for dogs. But anyway, that's another story. But that's why I'm late. I've been working my butt off here. Uh, where do I usually start? I always start with Patreon patrons. Thank God they're there. They are my mainstay, my biggest, largest, lovablest, nicest sponsor that I have. Um, but I've got something to talk about here. It's a big, giant, end-of-the-year giveaway. It's actually going to be given away before the end of the year. The hunt is for the end of the year. And... The only two of my sponsors, it's because I haven't got a hold of them yet, Walton's, who has everything but the meat, you know, if you want to cook it, stuff it, slice it, pack it, vac seal it, whatever you want to do with it, that's that's what Walton's has for you. Deck drawer system, deck, well, I'm not going to redo this, I am not, decked drawer systems for your truck, if you don't have it, you're missing out. Go check one out. Find a buddy. I know you got a buddy that's got one. You're like, you got your your deck envious. You have to check it out. It to go on a on a hunting tri- a long term hunting trip and to not have that is like it's like okay no I'd rather have a bunch of totes, right? And then dig into the totes. No, get yourself a deck drawer system. And I bet they're going to be part of this giveaway too. But the rest of my sponsors: Wilderness Athlete, Weatherby, Onyx, Boss. Shot shells, gunner kennels. We came up with, I, not, not we, no, not we, my title sponsor, Pike Gear, came up with the Grouse Hunt Giveaway. $7,500, that's right, I said $7,500 in gear. And what it is, the grand prize is two days, three nights, guided grouse and woodcock hunt with me, up in the UP, we're not on we're not on chuckers or quail or pheasants. We're up in the UP chasing grouse and woodcock. We're gonna get there October fourteenth, hunt fifteenth, sixteenth. Well, it's there's there's a couple days we're not hunting. October fourth, fourteenth through the seventeenth. 
in the Western UP, the winner will get a Weatherby Orion shotgun, just like mine, 26 inch barrel, matte finish, 20 gauge, made, made to slay the birds. They're going to get a pike, them and their, their buddy, because whoever wins this can bring a guest. How sweet is that? So I, I'm telling you guys, you got to make up five or ten new email addresses on Gmail and enter this, okay? Because you and your guest will win that trip. The shotgun, pike wingman vest, boss shot shells for the hunt, Onyx Elite membership for you and your guest, just in case you don't have Onyx yet. $250 worth of Wilderness Athlete. That's enough. Even if you're not in shape, you start taking Wilderness Athlete, you'd be able to outwalk me. The runner-up prize would be a Gunner Kennel, Pike Tongas Pants, a flat of 20-gauge Boss Shot Shells, Onyx Elite Membership, Upland Institute Subscription, $250 worth of Wilderness Athlete product. I... Come on! I've never been involved with something like this. The Grouse Hunt Giveaway from Pike Gear. Oh, just go to Pike. Just go to Pike Gear. It'll pop up on her website. Give them your name. Give them your information. And what is it? What is today? It's April twenty sixth. And I think we'll let this. We're going to let this run for the month of June, or the month of May. And then in June, we're going to pick a winner. We're going to start making plans for an epic. Oh, and just to throw it in there, in case you're a chatty Kathy like me and you win, I will bring my recording equipment up there because I don't go anywhere without it. And we will record a podcast after we get done hunting up there. And this is with a great guide up there that's hunted there for decades. We're going to be into the birds. I'm just telling you. I don't care what the hatch is. I don't care what the cycle is. We are going to be into the birds. So there. What do you think of that? That's, that's all I got to say about this. That's it. I love you guys. I love you girls. I love you sponsors. I love everybody. And I can't wait. I'm going to try to work up a little extra something else. Because once we start Airbnb or Verbo, you know, vacation, rental, whatever that is, VRBO, I think we're going to have, what I'm going to try to do is have three people when it, yeah, this will definitely be a Patreon thing. Three people, I'm going to reserve this place for the opener of dove season, and we will, oh, there's my wife calling me, and we will be dove hunting together. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Who's whining over there? Jill? My Vishla puppy. Why? My wire haired Vishla's not whining. Uh, not anymore. <laughs> No, he's doing good. Hanging out, chewing a stick. So we are sitting in the backyard of Beer Mountain. Jill and I and how many what we got? Five? You're four. There's six here. You got five? No, you have two. Oh, you're counting those two. Yeah. I, I don't count him yet because he's not much of a dog yet. <laughs> so Jill is Jill Jill, I'm gonna say it wrong. Corin. Mm-hmm. Perfect. I said it right this time. Mm-hmm. Uh, Jill happens to be family, family bound and family visiting Roanoke and Bridgewater. She came over today with her dogs and we went down to the river. Got the dogs to swim a little bit. Lost some shoes. Lost, lost your sand. Both your sandals <laughs> broke. Not my fault. But, uh, yeah, we were just shooting a shit about training and I guess it, people have heard you on my podcast before. They know you travel all over. The country, you guide for six months a year, you mm-hmm. you go to seminars, Smith seminars and other seminars. But what's what's coming up for you this year? We're still going to Pennsylvania. We'll leave here on Saturday and head north. Yeah. Um, that's training at a preserve. We'll be there for about five weeks. I might pick up another cocker. Ooh. Um, this one would be a started dog. Oh, really? How old? Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he's 18 months. Between oh, okay. a year. Over a year. Over a yeah, year. Yeah. yeah. Over a year um, from Saltaire Gun Dogs. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not too far into the Cocker world yet, yet, but um, what's the idea behind that one? Just finish it and... 
finish it, and he'll be a, a big part of our team. He'll be a, a member for of guiding the or for, for guiding. Yes. For guiding. Mm -hmm. So I got to tell you, I, I know you do this at Otter, Otter Creek, right? Mm -hmm. Otter Creek Distillery. Otter Creek Farmstead and Distillery. Farmstead and Distillery. Yeah. It's a long time. It is a very long name. You know, some of them just say, you know, Sedona, and you know what it is. And this is Otter Creek Farm and Distillery. <laughs> but I got an opportunity to go down to South Carolina and hunt it at Bray's Island. Okay. So, you know, I had a little cocker taffy before, mm -hmm. right? And didn't do near enough with her, but she never made me mad a day in her life. What she was was not steady to chasing birds that weren't <laughs> shot. But that's on me. That's all on me. Sure. It was not her. Anyway, and I hunted her once with Bravo, and that was at a preserve for a benefit we were doing. He didn't, he's pointing enough birds, he didn't seem to mind her coming through the mix and going for the flush, you yeah. know. And she's so quick she could beat him to the retrieve. Did How she make the connection? Yeah, on like the second time his beeper collar went off, she went beeline awesome. right past him. <laughs> Just like I know what that meant it, I know what it meant fifteen minutes ago. And if there's a chance that it means he's pointing another bird. Because like her search wasn't that great. And yeah. plus with the cocker it's only that 25, 30, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he was out there a ways, and I think we walked into that first one. But, you know, the dogs, they, she's hearing the beeper. She's seeing the dog. Right. And it just put it together. The next time she heard that beeper, she went right to it. That's actually really quick, I think. I, I could have got lucky. <laughs> I, I don't have a lot of data behind it. How do you do that at Otter Creek with the cockers and the pointers? Yes. Because that's a lot of... That's exactly how we run them. So... Totally steady on the pointers, and the cocker gets the... I wouldn't say totally steady. So they will point the birds, um, and then they are supposed to wait until everyone gets up there, and right. then they are supposed to wait until that cocker goes into flush. Right. Once that cocker finishes their job of mm -hmm. flushing, right. go out get the or birds. Or producing the bird. Right. Yeah. Go out we don't want to say the pointer's job is flushing. No. Because once the about. cocker puts the birds Once the cocker puts the birds... And then, then you'll let the pointers go after the, the retrieves? Yeah. So who wins? It's a 50-50. Is it? It depends on the cover. The cover. Yeah. Cocker's only that tall. Right. You can't see where all the birds go. You get some of those cockers that have that hard of a drive, and they will beat the bird dog every time. Well, and that's why I wanted to know if you did that. And I want to get into it, because this new cocker, a little training, cocker training. Okay. We've got, what, what's her? Oh, chunk. Chunk. I was going to say brunk. Chunk. I said that's the that's the biggest cocker spam I've ever seen. Well, that's why I say my is data <laughs> my data is only two. So right, I'm like maybe I shouldn't even say it's a big cocker spam. But um, what I saw at Bray's Island was uh, Scott Miller, who pretty well known trainer back in the day, yeah. field trialer. He lives there. He's like the resident dog trainer for all the people who live at Bray's Island, and he trains a string of dogs for guides. Has his own dogs, and when I saw him run his pointer and his cocker it was I never saw anything like it in my life that pointer never even stopped looking like it was on point mm -hmm. it, the intensity on the point stayed there throughout the cocker running out bringing us a bird and you know on plantation birds and plant birds there's more quail Yeah. cocker go back and said find him you know and if there's another bird there that cocker's literally running between the legs of the yep. Another quail get up. Mm -hmm. Cocker goes, and that pointer stood there like a bronze statue. Yeah. Have you got anywhere close to that yet? Some it, of them will do that. Yeah. Is it? That's something Scott said. Not all of them can do that. No, not all. The pointer, you mean? Yeah. The. the to it's be able to. It's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot because uh, ultimately the the pointer, the ones that want to go in and flush and chase. That's the reward is the chase. Right, right. Um, so for a cocker to go in and perform the task that that dog ultimately wants or that reward is something different. Right, and then to do it sometimes a second time. Right. And, and I looked at it, I could have walked up to this dog and took a picture of this pointer. Now, the other pointer wasn't, the other pointer was as steady as that first pointer, but the demeanor wasn't the same, right? He was... Looking around, right. he's like, well, "Where's my forty acres in the mule?" Mm -hmm. Right? He was, he, he was, he knew he wasn't supposed to move, but you know, he wanted to move. This right. first one, 
I think it was Cookie. Uh, it's like he, it's like some weird movie where they can just pause and everybody on the movie screens freezes and the superhero can walk around while everybody's frozen. That was like that pointer. Yeah. Oh my God! It. I had one that the one I lost. Digit. Mm-hmm. He he would stand there and wait, and, and he was intense good. the and whole good. time. Yeah, and as soon as there was nothing left, and every now and then he'd wait till he thought there was only one left, mm-hmm. and and then he might break. Like I, I need this one. Right. And then you gotta no no. It's not what we're doing here. So you've seen that now. What other what's the two pointers you got here? Uh, that is Tucker and Radar, and then and, Pinky is the Vishla. And you use them for guiding it in mm-hmm. otter. Mm-hmm. And are, when you're hunting, I, I, w- I won't go into all our conversations in the river, but when you're hunting, how much, like, how steady do you need to get your dogs for clients to that you don't know sometimes, many times, most of the time probably, unless it's a repeat client. How steady do I need to get my dogs for right. clients? Yeah. Steady enough that we can get up there, take a breath, and be ready to shoot birds. Okay. But that recall has to be there. Okay. Yeah. So how do, how do you enforce that in a training scenario? Enforce what? Well, like how do you got to cre- you can't do that, you can't be training while you're guiding. Well, I guess you can you know, be a little bit of a trainer. Uh, you can a little bit. You got to watch. But I mean, getting but ready not, for it. Right. Um, so I got away with a lot with a Vishla puppy, with Pinky. Okay. I did a lot of just letting her run and figure things out. And yeah. she wouldn't really bust anything. She'd stand there and wait. Yeah. So I, she got experience by not screwing anything up. Okay. And that uh, just keeps building on the dog, right? It's right. What's more... Um, and then you'll start to see them go one way or the other. They've either got it, and it's like, I know exactly what we're doing, right. and I'm going to play this game by your rules, or they'll start to slip off, and you'll see the wheels kind of fall off. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I wouldn't say the wheel, the wheels kind of fell well, they, off. They didn't fall her. off right on the hill, but... Well, it gets to be so much. The wheel bearing was going back. Right, <laughs> yeah. right. There's so much out there mm-hmm. in the field where we are. Way more shooting than you can do on a training right. day. Right. Right. So we've we've got to have a little bit more composure than, say, your... Average dog. Average dog, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, recall is important. I need I need my dog to come back when I call it. And that's half the battle. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I answered your question. Well, kind of, but like, do you, what would you do like before the, when you go on your last few years, your three, four month travel around the country, go to different training seminars, getting your dogs ready to hunt with a flushing dog? So we'll do a little bit more of that in Pennsylvania. I will start to steady Pinky up. That, that's what I'm getting yes. at. Yes. Um, and I will probably start to incorporate Chunk more once I have Pinky where I think I know I can say, I just need you to stop and stand right. here. I don't care what's around. So she's not she's not making a mistake based on a cocker. She's making a mistake based on she's not listening to you. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, that, and that's where it comes in. I mean, it's... It all boils down to obedience, I think. I, I, I'm not going to disagree with you. So. We had a couple of conversations that, you know, i got to get the recorder out here because <laughs> we want to talk about belly bands and pinch collars and... Prong collars. Gear. Yeah, lots of dog gear. Um, yeah, you, you came here and I said, no, just let the dogs in here. No, I'll put them on a tie-out stake. And you pound the stakes in the ground and mm-hmm. you're like, oh, no, it's what I'm used to doing. I'm like, well, you can just let them run. No, but that's a little bit of obedience, too. It, it, not yeah. obedience, but it's like, no, it's not your turn. Right. It's just time to chill. And you did that when you came out to our grounds too, yeah, uh, in Wisconsin or in Michigan. Well, I'm holding them responsible for something too. It's not free will. We're not gonna run around your yard and just, dig holes under the fence and try and escape, or dig holes because we think we found a mole or a lizard, well, which they will do eventually. Right, and there's who knows what's in that wood pile back there, right? right? So, and I because we were talking about. You, you said something like hunting dogs aren't hunting dogs anymore. They're house dogs. And I know what you mean because whatever the number is, whether it's 40% or 80% out 
are just pet dogs. Yeah. And those owners tend to give their dogs complete freedom all the time. Yes. Like with no repercussion. Like they would be tickled if he was just down there and he goes, oh darn, he got a skunk. Well, that's like shoving your four-year-old kid out the front door and saying, go have fun. I don't, don't care where you go. And don't get hurt. Yeah, don't and, get hurt. And don't get into a skunk. <laughs> so I mean, so I, I like when you did it. I was like, no, don't bother, don't bother. And you're like, shut up, Ron. I'm just gonna go put my stakes in the ground. But then we put Tagus on there, and he he was you know settled right down. He settled right down, and. I'm like somewhere in between. Like when I'm kind of by myself, I just let them have their head. Sure. But it never really pays you off. There's no payoff for just letting them be. Like there's no payoff to that. No. Well, they're always going to, how far can I go? R- right. They're always going to find something to get into. So where did you start learning that from? Learning what? That the dog needs a lot more structure, more fun. Because how long have you been at it now, messing with dogs? Six or six. Professionally, about yeah. five or six years. Right. So, where did you pick that up from? All of the trainers, the good yeah, ones. Everywhere you went to. Yeah. And they are all this. Is like, oh, that must be the right thing to do. Well, what trainer have you gone to and just said, we're just gonna fucking turn them all loose? Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> See where we go. Yeah. Okay. You got me on that one. No. I. But. I guess what I want to do is like bring it into the the homeowner dog like like they could use even if you're at home they could use more structure. Yeah. More rules, right? Rules, boundaries and limitations. There you go. And how do you do that? It just it starts from here. I mean, I saw you put on four collars in the dog. Your dog's right in a hammock. Mhm. In the back, in of, the the back tr- of the truck. In the back of the truck. And nobody busted out of the truck. No. Nope. Until you had a collar on them. Right. And then that was their turn to come out. Mm-hmm. And then they waited. Mm-hmm. And do you realize, I'm sure you realize that like 99% of people can't do that with four dogs. But I think that all comes down to your foundation. Yeah. Everything overlaps and overlays. So your crate training, perfect example, you have your crate in the back seat of your truck. Right. You could probably, if you wanted to, end up putting Tangus in the back of your back of your truck. Right. Without be, without any hesitation, because he knows that when he's in the back of the truck, because your crate's in the back of the truck, right. we're just gonna sit here and we're gonna we're ride. Just gonna chill out. Just another another stakeout. Right. Kinda. Yeah. Right. It's another. And place eventually to he sit. will, because I've had dogs like that. Yeah. They will sack out the whole twelve hour drive here. They're just like that's where we go. Right. Um. But that's not a lot of years. Like, you to me, because I think the first time we talked was probably three years ago, you, or three seasons ago, because you came out to the Navda grounds. Is it three or four? Or maybe four. Might have been three. So, but, anyway. But where was the start where you just had this desire to just keep going to different trainers and different places to, like, I want to learn from them? Like, because that... People, I mean, you had the ability to do it because of your job, but right. not a lot of people do that. I'm always the person that asks why. Mm-hmm. Why do you do what you do? Right. Whether it's right or wrong, why? Yeah. And that's just with trainers and how they train their dogs and what equipment they use. Why are you training your dog that way? And why are you using the equipment that you do? Yeah. So by diving into those questions, it kind of opened up a new playing field. Right. Where did you, how did you find all the places you went to? Like you went to all these different, just from being on. The internet and making connections. I mean, you were a connection because I listened to your podcast and I think I just threw a random text out. Yeah. And you gave me a call. Yeah. Well. Yes. I appreciate that. <laughs> and what did you, what did you think when you came to the Nebda Training Grounds? Did you see a lot of stuff? You were oh, it was a shit show. <laughs> I thought I was hoping you'd say that. Oh, it was a complete shit show. <laughs> and I bet you probably most Nebda Training Days are. They are. They are, because you get, what you get is a bunch of. Uh, no, it's true though. It, 
I have I, to bite my tongue. No, I, I totally agree with you. And in years when I would be there, like for the whole summer, you know, and I'd be there every Wednesday. I try to do a little something structured for everybody. And no matter what I do, somebody will come out of the new puppy. And it's, oh, yeah, yeah, Hey, I got a dead bird here. You want to show them? But they don't know what this person is. This person's the home dog, pet dog, one dog owner. They're like, well, should I? Oh, yeah, yeah. Here, throw this bird for it. That could be the wrong thing to do for that dog. Could be. Could be. And then when you see all the... You get 20 people like that out there. It, it's the blind leading the blind. It's like, it's like Helen Keller trying to figure out Braille. Somebody had to figure that out before her. I'm going to piss a lot of people off by saying this. I, I, and there's some good to it. I kind of relate NAVDA as a fraternity for bird dogs. It's not, it's not, far, for, it's not far fetched. Um, and you've got your good and your bad in your fraternities, right? I mean, you've got your crazy parties and yeah. your whatever, but you also have your your community and your camaraderie, yeah. and you people are doing something good for right. whatever the Right, you can the learn and does. grow, and you're part of something. Mm-hmm. Um, so it definitely gives a, a new person a feeling of family and fraternity. Exactly. It's just that there's really not. In fact, I was talking to Justin this morning. And we're, we're working on some stuff. And he said he had a call from a guy who took his dog to two different trainers, and he, then he was going to go to a NAVDA chapter. And he's like, I told Justin, I said, there's probably, there's probably more than this, but I could only come up with six NAVDA chapters, and there's 80 of them, that I know if you went there, there is a true trainer as part of that chapter, and he would help stop some of the... Like, ah, you know what, let, let, your dog's not ready for this yet. Right. And I think people get real into, like, I've got a bird dog. I am I need to hunt with it right now. I need to give it its first bird. I need to I need to make it heal right off the bat. In fact, today you said, I don't teach my dogs to heal. I teach them to walk on a leash properly. But you, Or you don't use a command. Not really. I've started to include the phrase with me to my bird dog's. Because I say heel when I'm guiding. Right. Most of the time my heel is directed towards the cocker. Right. I don't need to start saying commands and my bird dog to get confused because he thinks I'm talking to him. Right. So you just rather you make a leash correction. You're, you're getting healing out of him. Right. That, well, that's just manners, I think. Right. I don't want to be pulled on a lead. Right. They don't want to be yanked on. They don't want to be turned right. ass over tea kettle. I don't. Well, I don't like the pressure, and neither do they. <laughs> We've come to an understanding. <laughs> and and you walk down to the river with you know four dogs on a leash. Or, exactly, yeah. and I released them when I felt that they were walking with me and going with me. They deserved to get off the leash. Sure. Yeah. They earned it. Yeah. So, let's talk gear. Okay. You you were. Let's talk pinch collar, okay? Because you, you actually pinch came up, or prong. Uh, pinch. Okay. Okay. Um, you your your grandma lives right up here. That's, that's a prong collar. That's a prong collar. A pinch collar, from what I understand, and See, I've, I've kind I've of called them both the same. So uh, they're, they're different. Pinch. They're different different pieces of equipment. A pinch collar, from what I understand, is a leather, almost slip lead. Oh, with that action, okay, with I know what you're saying. Duds, in embedded in the leather, right? And it has the same effect or action as your prong, but there it tightens up and loosens up. Correct, right. and and it distributes pressure evenly around the neck, mm-hmm. where a normal slip collar will distribute pressure if used improperly at one point of the neck, and the dog can end up choking itself or doing damage to it in its yeah. esophagus. Granted, you can do that with a prong collar, too, if you use it wrong. Right. Um, but the prong or the pinch have those duds or prongs evenly distributed around the neck to distribute the pressure more right. evenly. As opposed to just an old slip collar that 
is like a noose almost. It, Correct. But, there's but really it's not, not supposed to be a noose. It's <laughs> not supposed to tighten up and just stay there. No, no. It's, it's about how you use it. It's the meant tool. to relax. Correct. Yeah. It's the action. So pinch and prong will both relax if used properly. So right. will slip lead, yes. So what do you like more? The, the prong? I have never used a pinch collar. I know what it is and I've seen them. I've never put a pinch collar on my dog. So that would be the leather one with the... Yeah. Um, the West Gibbons method, Mo Lindley, yep. uses that style. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've been to his... Clinic. I have. Yep. I've been to one. Mm-hmm. Yep. It was great. It was great. Um, made a lot of connections through there, a lot of new friends. Um, but as far as the prong color goes, that is a more... I want to say a more pet industry, but it's it's really not. Um, they sell them in pet industry. Right, but I think it might have stemmed from more of a working dog, police, yeah. that kind of line. Yeah, because it's German in its origin. Correct. And we both said the best ones are made in Germany. Right. And and that that literally pinches the skin all the way around. And like when it closes, it, it creates kind of little... It looks like that, yeah. but it actually just sticks in this skin, and I said stick, and it's not sticking. Right. It is applying pressure evenly around. It is not actually... A lot of points. It is not actually pinching the skin. It is evenly distributing pressure. Yeah. And you like that? Is that what you're... If used properly, <laughs> yes, I like that well, tool. Well, how do we use it properly? So, I used it with my grandmother... She recently got a rest... Your grandmother's dog. Let's, yes, my grandmother's dog. I'm let's sorry. I did that. not put You're, the collar she is on my a, grandmother. She is in a retirement community, and I don't want anybody to think that... <laughs> uh, I did put it on myself. You showed her. I did. I yeah. showed her. Because it's such a scary-looking thing. Mm-hmm. Um, I needed to give her an edge. Because she is not as... St- stable on her feet as I am, nor is her timing and finesse the same. Um, Just like if you and Justin were to handle the same dog, Mm -hmm. Justin probably has more finesse in his handling. Right. He could touch a dog less and get it to do just as much, if not more, than if you would handle it. Then yanking on it harder and everything else, yeah. Um, So the prong collar gave my grandmother an edge to use the least amount of pressure possible but give her control right which you could also do with just a regular old nylon slip lead and, or a, and we a started smith, there and a smith what do they call it a wonder lead wonder lead mm-hmm. same um, same idea right and the wonder lead may have worked um i just chose to go with a prong because i didn't want my you didn't want your grandma to break it up <laughs> well yeah but i didn't want her walking around with a Rope that looks like a lasso <laughs> around the retirement home. <laughs> They're like, what are you doing, cowgirl? <laughs> the, it's very effective. And did you go to a Smith's or did you find out about that first? Before you went to a Smith's, the Wonder Lead. The Wonder Lead? I learned about the Wonder Lead when I attended the first seminar. The first seminar. Yeah, and that was... That was when I first started in Pennsylvania. I went to a Rick Smith seminar, Mm -hmm. um, the foundation seminar. And then I've been to two other foundation seminars by Ronnie Smith. Mm -hmm. And I've been to an intermediate seminar with Ronnie Smith. What do you, I would assume, because I've been to, I've been to one Hickok seminar, Mm -hmm. which is similar, you know, like, let's get people out here and. Let me work with your dog. Is the the Wonderly? It's a great name, right? It's a great sell, sales name. It is. It's a Wonderly, mm-hmm. right? Do you think it's because most of those dogs just didn't have any idea what they're supposed to do when they're on a leash, or what? Probably is, that has a lot to do with it. Um, most of the time, people will bring their dogs out on a harness or just on a regular flat collar. Yeah. And they're not getting the action that they need. You can't. You physically cannot get that action off of a regular flat collar. Flat collar. Um, 
now once the dog understands that pressure, sure, I can, I can go to a flat collar. Yeah, um, but it's the actual release of pressure that the dog complies right. to. Right, which goes to e collars. It's it's pressure on pressure off, pressure mm-hmm. on pressure mm-hmm. off. Mm-hmm. Your dogs, have you? I don't. I don't. I shouldn't say resorted to it. Do you just do it as a matter of course? Put the pinch collar or prong collar on them, or do you start with a wonder lead and see how they react? It depends on the dog. I've actually only put the prong on two of my dogs just to see if it would may, work, to, may, to test it out myself before yeah. I said, here, use this. Right. Um, and again, I put it on my neck to see how much it would hurt. Was it uncomfortable? I mean, it didn't feel good. <laughs> I didn't hurt, though. Right. Um, it's just a different tool. Right. I, if I think I need a little more pop or a snap, maybe the Wonder Lead. The Wonder Lead is a neat tool in that it doesn't matter which way it's put on. Mm-hmm. So with a slip lead, you have to put it on a certain way or the action won't work correctly. Right, right. It won't release. Right. With your wonder lead, that lead is such a stiff rope yeah. that it opens up no matter if yeah, it's on the top or the bottom. It, it mm-hmm. opens up. And, and Ronnie is actually using a different way to put it on depending if the dog scoots too close or gets away from you. So he's yeah. using it to his advantage. Right, right. You could... Yeah. But it's nice for the novice because you can have that dog correct itself and you not really put a whole lot of pressure right. on it. He pulls, he, he, he if feels... If you turn and walk a different direction, right. that dog's momentum will correct itself. Right. Now, you've watched the Upland Institute. Mm-hmm. I, you, you've got that. And what I, and I've showed a few people that Justin's like doesn't use any word. He just takes the dog on a slip lead, turns direction 180 degrees. And when the dog complies, he feels that complete relax. Right. Same same thing. Right. And the dog's like, oh, oh, I guess if I stack next to you, I don't feel that at all. Right. But then there's the dog that, like, there's some dogs that don't care. Right. And maybe you said earlier um, they probably didn't have a foundation on her, which is probably true. But let's say you get that dog that hasn't had a good foundation. There's different. Some dogs will take that wonder leg and goes, "Oh, I get it. Right. I get it. Okay. <laughs> don't ask me twice." But then there's some that just go like, "I don't care." Mm-hmm. Have you seen that? A little bit. You can you can still get a good hardy correction if you need to. No. Yeah. Um, by using momentum and and the dog, but again, I'm sure there are dogs that are not going to care. Right, there, there's there's dogs that there are those personalities. I mean, I hate that saying, but there's dogs that you can take a two by four to, and it doesn't take anything out of them. They right. don't they don't care. No. Is that desire, or is that a lack of cooperation, or is it bad breeding? I don't know. Well, I think that depends on the situation <laughs> and the dog, too. That's a case-by-case basis. Oh, my God, I don't like this, or oh, my God, I do. Because that's the one thing I can speak on, you know, and a lot of things you say about mostly... You know, if, if, like I said, we're not trying to hurt anybody's feelings, but the majority of hunting dogs out there are pet dogs, are home dogs, house dogs. Mm-hmm. But there's great house dogs that hunt great. But there's a lot of people out there that they get into it, and it's almost like they're afraid. Do you think they're like afraid of correcting or afraid of their dog? Yeah, probably both. Um, oh, they they don't. The fear of not knowing kind of overwhelms people. So they're, so they're afraid to do it right and they're afraid to do it wrong. So if I just stand here and not do anything... Sounds like a dog that blinks birds. <laughs> but that's confidence in the handler. Mm-hmm. 
So what would Therein be, lies a problem, too. Uh, all right, here's a good question. Like, you are not 30 years into this, right? No. Um, advice for somebody getting a new dog. Like, and, and I get the emails twice a week, 52 weeks a year, getting my first dog. Uh, I Or here, here's one, you'll love this. And that I think his name's Hayden. Don't be mad at me, Hayden, because you listen. He says, I... I've got a pheasant wing, but I plan on hunting more than just pheasants. Do I need to get a wing from all the different bird species? And I said, no, you don't. I mean, that short answer was no. Right. But going back to the new person who's like, man, it sounds exciting. I watched it on television. My friend's got a dog. I want a dog, whether it's a Munsterlander, Pointer, Vigla. Advice for a new person, because I know you... You're passionate about that. Yeah. Take your time, but but not just on the dog. Take your time with yourself. Mm-hmm. People need to teach themselves before they teach their dog. Yeah. And maybe that's where that gap is coming from. They don't they don't know where to start. Right. And then the dog looks up at them and says, okay, well, what are we doing? And they look down at their dog and says, I have no idea what we're doing. Here we go. And then the dog says, well, if you don't know what you're doing, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go on instinct. Right. Right. And there you can find your confrontation. Um, learn. And, and don't stop at one thing. People, I think, find a method... They go on Facebook and they say, I've got this new dog. What training method should I use? Right. And then all this stuff is thrown out at them. Yeah. Oh, you can only do positive training with this breed because it's so sensitive. Right. Or you have your, oh, go to this trainer. Go to... A Rick Smith seminar. A Rick Smith seminar. Right. Oh, but I have a lab. Oh, we'll do the, the Wild Rose way. Right. Or whatever you want. Whatever method. Mm-hmm. If you explore all of those, they all come down to the science of dog training, which is your classical conditioning and your operant conditioning, and you get into your four quadrants of learning. Expound. So you have your positive, I hope I don't screw this up, your positive reinforcement, mm-hmm. so that is sit Good sit, treat. You're positive. positive. You are adding something to repeat an action in Mm -hmm. the dog. Then you have your positive punishment. So you're adding something to decrease a behavior. And now I'm blanking (laughs) on an example. I'll think of one. Yeah. And then there's negative reinforcement and negative punishment. Right. So, negative punishment would be you holding a ball and my dog, or whatever dog, barking at you. And right. you don't like that behavior, so you just take the ball away. Right. That's negative punishment. Right. Your negative reinforcement... Be to scold the dog? Would be, no, would be taking something away to encourage a behavior. So that would be your mix, your e-call or mix, to recall. Okay. You are taking away that stimulation because they are doing something right. They encouraged it. They turned that off. Mm-hmm. Um, your positive punishment would be a bark collar. Okay. You're adding stimulation to decrease an action okay. in the dog. And it does get very confusing, as you can see. Right. I kind of struggled through right, it. Right, right, right. And then you get all these new dog owners. It's, it's, it's And then their mind's blown. Right, right. Like, positive, negative, negative, positive. I, I don't know what red or black cable to put on the battery to jump my truck. Right? I listened to a, a working dog podcast this morning as I was driving up here. Mm-hmm. Um, and he said, well, it all comes down to consistency and marking your behaviors, whether it's good or bad. Yeah. So use your rewards for your 
your good behaviors and yep. your punishments for bad behaviors. And basically, all your different trainers have different parts in different quadrants. Some are more positive reinforcement and will treat, 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 right. treat. And your positive only only have those two quadrants. Right. Your positive reinforcement and your positive uh, punishment. Right. So they're only treating when they do something good. Or not treating. Or not doing anything when they do a bad behavior. Mm -hmm. And you can you can run into problems with that. Yeah. But if you somehow balance it, which is your balanced dog training, with you have all four quadrants, you get all of those. And it's each trainer has a blend of each. You know, and the word negative, it sounds painful. Right. Right? And, and so I think people will be like, oh... But what does negative mean? Negative is taking something out of the equation. Right. You're subtracting something. And I think people think it means punishing. Right. But it's but not. No. It's, it's, but they think of electricity. Oh, positive, negative, positive, negative. And so to a new dog owner, you've said that, and you keep going to different clinics all over the country to, to get what... You may not use that, but then you might have a dog that, you know what, that might, that might apply. Because they all can apply. Right. They just, but if you're new at it, right. you, you don't know, you don't know if you're on foot or horseback. <laughs> you know? So, what was, any mistakes you made early on? I made a ton of mistakes. That's well, how I mean, you learn. Any, any well, yes, you only learn by doing things. Well, what is it, Thomas Edison took him 900 tries to make a light bulb. Right. And then he finally made a light bulb. What is a couple, like, you, that you almost can't believe you did wrong? And, I, you know, I'm not trying to pinpoint it, but, like, like, oh, you know what? That's something I would probably tell somebody to not do. All right, um, let, me, let me give you an example, then. Okay. Okay. And I've seen people do it. I've seen people do it on videos. I've seen people do it in tests, which they shouldn't. I think I know what I want to say. Pick, okay, picking up dog moves and picking a dog up and bringing it back to where it was before it made the infraction. Mm -hmm. And I've heard people say, and they've done, they'll always do that. They'll always put a dog back. And then I've heard other people say, like, I don't know what you're actually teaching the dog. What, what are you teaching the dog by picking it up off all fours and moving it back six feet? So that, to me, that would be a mistake if you didn't have a, if you just saw somebody do it and you did it. What does that mean to a dog? Like so. Did you want me to go off of that or what? I was no, go say. off what you're going to say. Another example uh, of something that you like. Oh God, I won't do that again. What I'm trying to change now in my training is I'm, I'm trying to stop reaching for bumpers. I have created a habit out of myself to reach down to the dog to get something when they bring it back. Okay. I've created in Tucker, he will bow his head down towards the ground. He'll bring it right to me, but he'll bow his head down towards the ground. Because I've and you every single you time created. I've taken it. Yeah, I absolutely created it. Right. So I'm trying to overcompensate now, and I've, I've done it in a, I wouldn't say I've done it in a couple of dogs. Each, each dog has f flaws, and I could mm -hmm. do one thing with one dog and another thing yeah. with one dog and create two different problems. Right. Or no problems in one dog, and no, yeah. it, it all depends. Um, but that's one thing you'd be like, I'm not going to do that again. People are so concerned about taking stuff from their dogs, <laughs> yeah. and then they want to force their dog to put something in their mouth. Right. So why are we killing an action mm -hmm. or a habit in the beginning, and then saying, "Well, now I want you to hold this." Right. So I get that makes me take a step back. Yeah. Now, I have. I don't want to say I've completed it because I haven't. Mm -hmm. um, I have started, and I can I can get him to go out and retrieve something. Mm -hmm. um, 
a trained retrieve. Mm -hmm. I've done that with Striker. And I made it fun and he'll he'll do things, he'll go out, fetch bumpers for me, he'll hold things for me. It's still a little sloppy. I haven't refined it and yeah. polished it yet. Um, but he didn't always hold things though either. So, so there's just there's just so many variables right. in it, I think. But did we answer the question? I don't know. I, I don't know. Now we're getting into trained retrieves. I, I know, I know, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> like, oh, because I could go into trained retrieves. Right, I could get into that too. And I feel like and I've told people Tagus went through not a lot of hold and carry, but at five, six months when he had his teeth in. I get I get a dog on a table. I just want to teach him hold mm -hmm. and then walk them off the table while they're teething. No, after they oh, okay. erupted all their adult teeth, mm -hmm. and I and I I could be lucky, but to this day I've never had a dog that didn't retrieve. Now again, unless I put the polish on it and have them look at me, and but still even during the, the hold and carry process. I tap it, I pull it. They're not allowed to open their mouth until I have my hand on it. And that is not a cute open their mouth yet. The hand on it and then a verbal. And I you know, I've gotten a lot of dogs, especially with Broncos, that you can't put you literally can't put that high level train retrieve on them, but hold and carry, you can do it's really no pressure, it's just right. repetition. Right. Um and I, I found that that is I've told people I said as much as the value of it is, you got a dog that's going to hold something. You're spending all this time on this table, whatever it is, high, low table, or on the ground, or whatever you want to do it. It's like one of the things you'll spend the most personal time with, where they don't have their feet under them out in the field, right? right? How much have you messed with train retrieve? A little bit. Um, I do more table work than I do like a trained retrieve. I love tables. So. When you say table work, what do you, what do you incorporate? Any kind of raised surface that and you get. And what do you do with them when they're up there on the table? Things make them walk back and forth. Sometimes I'll, I'll do a little bit of retrieving, mm -hmm. um, and I did that in air quotes because I'll put my bumper down at the end, and I mean they can't they can't go anywhere. Right. And they, those are the dogs that will naturally, will naturally just want to go up and pick things right, up. Right. 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 Um, it's like the cocker. I might do mm -hmm. that. And then your molding behaviors. Yeah. That are you're already there. A, you're taking a good behavior and just making right. it, you're polishing the good exactly. behavior. Exactly. Exactly. Then you got a dog. Now you have two pointers that retrieve in rivers. <laughs> I do. <laughs> which, which is rare. Yeah. Okay. Well, and neither of them. How, do they retrieve birds as well as they do bumpers? Tucker does. And yeah, is, the one that went out and brought it back every single right. time. And I've never put a trained retrieve on that dog. Never. Now, that didn't start coming out till two years ago. That's now, him developing his own and probably four. Probably a little bit of jealousy involved in that, too. Another dog. Mm -hmm. Now. Mm -hmm. And lots of praise to that other dog when they do it right, right and bring it back. And the other dog wants, like, oh, where's my 40 acres? In the right. Middle? Yeah. But you haven't. Have you ever taken a dog through the whole thing to the point where they're ear pinching and collar reinforcement and, you know? Yeah, I can reinforce with the collar on yeah. Striker. Yeah. That's how far I got. Yeah. Um, it is sloppy. But it's, that's just the way it is. And I don't... No, sloppy is him ducking his head down or not, not mm, like, presenting it? Anymore. Not presenting it. Every now and then he'll drop it and... and right. I'll be like, what are you doing? He'll be like, oh, 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 sorry. And he'll pick it back up and he'll wag his tail and wiggle his butt and right. bring it back to me. And you're like, oh. That, I think, is a little sloppy, but yeah. I'm not, I oh. don't need that. Right, but how about when they got a bird in their mouth? Is it? That is more of, and it depends on the scenario, yeah. again. Um, a lot of times that competition comes out, go out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it first. Right. And then what it becomes is a command for a here. Right. And then I'm just toning. Come here. Because if they drop it, it's going to get picked up again. So are you going to reinforce the picking it up again, or are you going to go no. pick it up? 
No, it'll get picked up because I usually have more than one dog on the ground. Okay, so some other dog is. So he's gonna miss out if yeah. he drops it. Okay. Now not everyone has more than one dog to do that with. Right, right, right. Especially newbies. With right. Their first one dog. But but maybe maybe we need to take it back a step and say, well, well don't punish your dog for picking up your shoe that you left on the ground. Right. Call your dog to you. Praise it. Right. When it when it brings you the shoe and then take it away and right. give your dog something else to chew on. Right. It's almost like don't don't give it the name, don't give it the correction. It's not appropriate. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing that I think really helped with retrieving is I will I incorporate a give and a take command. It'd be like And I've actually got a tug toy and every other bird dog trainer is gonna hate this. Okay, let's hear it. I have a tug toy. Mm-hmm. I will play tug of war with my dog. Which you're right. Most people say, Oh, don't, don't play do that. Don't, right. Yep. Yeah. But I've balanced it out. So that when they tug, they're not going to let go. Well, I'm playing. I've got engagement. They're playing with me. Right. And I have control. So when I say, when I stop and I say give, the mouth comes off. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't, I usually just don't take it away. I say, okay, take it. Right. And take it is another word that I incorporate. So I've got give, hold, take it. So, give is release. Yeah. Take it is you can have it, and I don't I don't care what you do with it. Right. If I'm still holding on to it, I'm still holding on to it. Whatever. Right. And hold is hold it until I take it back. Right. And you want your hand on it when they when you say. Take it. Yeah. Yeah, usually because I always have my hand on it. Right. Right. Um, and I've noticed that I take things and I give it back. I take things and I give it back, and then I let them. Run off with it. They'll come back. Right. Here, play, play with me. Play tug. Yeah. So yeah, you, you'll, we'll get some emails on that. One. Yeah. Because everyone will say, "Don't play tug of war with your dog." But then, there's tug of war knowing that you're trying to build something. There is a balance in it. Right. That's why I said and that. It's so not it's, just a free for all. I watched an Instagram this morning. No, a TikTok. And there was a wire hair in it, and this guy's daughter was on her back with a tug toy and the wire hair just pulled her across the kitchen floor that's cute but that's not teaching the dog <laughs> but dogs have fun right yeah dogs hold dog, on to something that dog also he does that enough times he's like that's how i do it right you no know, let me hit a we got a little pause here no nope, we're good, we're good. <laughs> Um, You're so popular. Well, the phone rings a fair bit. Mm-hmm. That fair rings. So I want to, because that was Justin, you, you watched some of the Foundations of Fundamentals. I don't know, if, did you look yeah. at the whole course? or? I don't think I got to the finished yeah. part of it. What, what did you think about it's the great. information that was in there? Perfect. It was great. Um, Any, anything that you hadn't seen anywhere else, or is it all pieces of what you've seen? Most of it's pieces of what I've seen um, but again, he's got his own Method. technique to yeah, it. Right. Yeah. Um, I love the calming touch. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. That will do wonders in a vet clinic. If nothing else. If nothing else. Right. Right. So that way when you take your dog to a vet, it can be properly examined. Mm-hmm. And... Or, no. or even a little minor this or that. Right. Right. Um, there's another rabbit hole is vets and vet clinics. That's a podcast there. Is it? Oh, yeah. I don't, I don't trust veterinarians anymore. Really? Nope. Um, is it because you have to go to so many around the country, or is it because you've never found the one that works for you? A lot of them will try and give behavioral advice when they've only maybe taken a class or two. And they've taken four years of how to medically treat a dog. Right. So this 
dog who comes in and maybe is a little bit reactive, unsure, unstable. They say, oh, that dog needs to be on medication. But really, it doesn't have a foundation or obedience. To even be there. Right. Right. But anyway, I digress. Well, no, so the calming touch. Yeah, I, calming touch is great. I've never, I've never formally done that, but the fact that, like, I always took my dogs at six months through hold and carry, so there's a lot of raised platform. Right. A lot of stroking them. I, I let them hold it for a long time. So I was kind of doing that in some regards, but I wasn't literally, you know, going down to the legs and moving the legs and, and looking at a paw. Because a dog that hasn't had that done to it, right? Oh, they're like, eh, eh, you know. Nails. <laughs> so many dogs have problems with getting their nails clipped. Oh yeah. And I don't know why, and it's probably because they don't, they, they aren't used to it. Right. That calming touch can solve that problem. Right. Because you start messing with everything from your toenails to your earlobes, inside your ear. Sure. You, you could take it. What we showed in the Upland Institute, you could take that to the point of, hey. Get a Q-tip. Clean your clean your dog's ear. Absolutely. The dog should just stand there and give himself to you. And and that's like, I was wondering how you, when I saw you get your four dogs out of the back of the truck, it almost is like, well, you had to do something similar to that, that they knew they had to be calm, and it was their turn. Mm-hmm. Did you do something similar to that, or do you think it was just your... Repetition of like ah, ah you no, know, it's her turn. Collar on, because it almost looks like you refined it. The calming touch to well, that's having thresh- four do- that's thresholds too. So not only is that calming touch, but that's waiting for thresholds. So by thresholds, I mean four ways, anything, that, right, anything, anything really. So you do that early with the dogs, which and he Justin does that too. Right. Justin right. does that very beginning stages that is crate training your dog and not teaching your dog to rush out of a a crate door close the door in its face a little bit that's a threshold yeah and then and remind me i don't know if he i think he does he does thresholds at doors too oh yeah 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 you don't get to go through the door first car door is the same thing right car door is the same thing so and I, i i keep going back to I watched you do four dogs, and I've only got two, and I go to one side and get one done, let it run around. I don't know if I've ever tried to get four dogs to just like, okay, it's not my turn yet. But then that might tie back into the tie-out stakes. It ties back into... It all overlays. Yeah. All that. And that's got nothing to do with getting them around birds. No, it doesn't. Characteristics, but they don't come with obedience. Mm-hmm. That that is just not come in the package. Obedience is what we give them, right. or you want to call it structure. You want to call it uh, whatever you want to call it. If you miss those little things, and let's say you're trying to, you, you're the newbie and you, you you go hunting and like, God, I'm having so much trouble, you know, woeing my dog, and I I put him right on a woe post or I put a collar on him. But they didn't do any of that stuff. Tailgate manners, door manners, crate manners. It, it, it's like a snowball going downhill. Yeah. It's just all of a sudden, if you do all those little things, the, dog, the dog's like going, I, I wait until, I, I know, I get my signal from my owner, now it's time to go hunt. Now it's time to go do stuff. And therein lies your cooperation. Well, and what level of natural cooperation, right? Like we talked about, I think before we hit record, there's absolutely you could say a cocker spaniel has a higher level of cooperation sure. than a pointer. Yeah. Just took two of them, raised them like heathens in the woods. The cocker's going to have more cooperation. Yeah, probably. You know. Yeah. I mean, That's st- genetics. statistically, right? Yeah. It's just a dog that is more about connected to you and. Um, well, there's independence and codependence. Yeah, there's there's that. Where Tagus could be a little codependent on me. Right. I, th- I think. But I think your Vishlas in general, and I don't know about your wired hair, but your Vishlas in general, yes, are going to be a little more codependent. Yeah. That's why they call him a Velcro dog. Right, yeah. 
Where they don't make names up for no reason. Right. Right. Well, expound on that a little bit. Cooperation. Well, oh, no. And I'm no. Because I'm coming. I from am the, no expert in. No, anything. no. But I'm coming from the testing world. Where it's a category on my car. Right. And what we try to do is we try to observe. We try to desert on our scorecard. Desire and cooperation go through field, go through tracking, go through water. There, it's just the two things that, according to that rule book and that method, is like we should be able to ascertain a dog running in the field is cooperative and uncooperative. There's there's a different look to the dog. There's a different demeanor to the dog. There's so before I answer that question, define it. How are you judging it? We're judging it as a dog. Because that's perspective, too. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. And that's what we, in in our test, it's not a speculative test. It's a, um, I'm not, that's not the right word. Um, oh, damn it. I did a brain fart like you did earlier. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't, I don't Damn it. I don't, damn it, Jill. They're subjective and objective. And yeah. now, now we're getting into wordplay. Oh, now we need Webster's Dictionary. But... In, in a field, okay, here, here's an example. You got a puppy out in the field. Mm -hmm. He's out there running. I don't care if he's 50 yards or 200 yards. If, and it's a big, let's just say it's a big field, big, bigger than you need. It's called a section of land, but it's flat. Mm -hmm. Dog can see you. And if we are walking with a handler and we say, you know what, let's go to the west. And we start walking to the west. Dog's still hunting to the north. At some point, the dog should, it's like, oh, oh, I didn't know we were turning. He still might stay at 200 yards, but he's going to work himself to the west. Sure. That's cooperation. That's what, well, that's how we format it. Okay. Without a whistle. And we tell handlers, like, be yourself when you're running a puppy. You know, be yourself. Let We, we want to see the raw puppy. Yeah. But we also know that if... Puppies out there running, hunting. We don't expect them to be paying attention, but there's a certain thing with a dog where, if all of a sudden you turn left, that dog should basically stay in front of you. So if you're, if you want to hunt a, a drainage mm -hmm. in Iowa, and the drainage bends to the left, I don't want the dog still going to the north. I want him to go to the west with me, and we would, I, I would call that co natural cooperation, just like, oh. Oh, we're going that way. That's that's how I would call it. Does that need to be taught too? The teaching part would be the obedience part. But what if? Uh, so you still have to teach your dog to come with you. But he should naturally hunt. Like I don't say I, that's the wrong way to say it. Ideally, the dog should hunt in front of you. Agreed. Right. You don't want a dog that's always behind you. That drives you crazy. So if you happen to turn, the dog should be aware of your presence, even when he's hunting, and still be out in front of you. Like, if let's say if I took your dogs in this field right now and you walked all the way down to that farmhouse, they'd be in front of you. Yeah. If you made a U-turn and came back up, where would they go? I would probably whistle and cue to let them know, hey, I'm turning around, and they should run it back, back in front. In front. Of you. So to me, that would be obedience. But I've taught that. But you wouldn't see it naturally? I bet you would. Probably. Yeah. I guess I've reinforced it. You, you're cognizant of it early on. Right. So when you turn, you whistle... And it's like, oh, we're... So I guess dogs should naturally be in front of you, yes, but that is that because they're selfish and just want to be in front of you? I don't know. <laughs> Some dogs, maybe. Because technically a super cooperative dog will look up at you at the whole time and say, what are we doing? Yeah. But they can't do that when they're running 30 miles an hour. Right. But they can keep... They... But that's your independence. Yeah. I don't do your thing. Do your thing. I, and again, I don't go to the puppy test. You're not a sure. in a, in a, field, in a finish test. What if I'm doing utility? I'm going to blow the whistle so he looks at me and so he sees me going that way. 
Does that happen a lot with puppies that just don't go with? Oh, yeah. Oh, there, there's puppies, the itty that Brocko of mine, she got a one in her field search because she went nowhere near where anybody was. She was just gone. She was just gone. She was self-hunting. But she's still searching. Probably. But we still demand that the dog is hunting for the gun. So if, that has to be taught. Yeah, but there's natural cooperation that the dog would just know. The dog knows, oh, we're going that way. That's, I know it's, that's leadership. Right, and well, I guess maybe. that could tie into cooperation. But I would say that's more leadership fellowship. I am leading, so you're going to follow me. And I don't, I don't, I don't know. I'd be interested to see what Justin says. I would do. I would. We should have just answered the phone call and got him right in on this podcast. Um. All right. Let me ask. I'm, I'm just we're yeah, just no, no. Your bullshit and drinking yeah. beer. Let's get that big field again, flat field, so the dog could see you. Sure. We're talking Iowa. <laughs> yeah. Almost no hills. Mm-hmm. If you stopped, how far would you go? Dog, your dog go. Depends on the dog. Okay. Radar, the one who's at a trial stock, will take a line, and he'll go. He'll go. About how far? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> a couple hundred yards for oh, okay. sure. That's not, yeah, no, hundred. I don't think my dogs would range out that far as far as mileage. Right. Un- unless they hit something that they like. Well, sure, because then you're yeah. Then we go into no, I'm my... searching for game and. The wind's coming from here, and I'm on to something. Right. So I, that would be a good thing. But, like, if you just stopped in the field, and all of a sudden your sandal broke. They'd come check on me. That's what I'm getting yeah. at. That's a piece of cooperation. That's a dog that's like, what's up? What are we doing? Right. You know, and that's what we talk, when I talk about natural cooperation. A dog that's kind of like an invisible leash to you. Like, they'll, they'll check back. If you instead of using yeah, but you don't want that. Some dogs. Well, it depends on what game you're playing, right? Right. Right. So does that come in with being taught? I don't know. (laughs) Are we are we talking field trial horseback? Right, because they're taught to go and not come back. Go until you get called. Right. We'll or unless you find something, don't don't move. Right, and when they do find something, they they go as far as to have a scout. Right. On horse, and go hey. The dog's over here doing his job. But that's cooperation. No, see, I think that's... I don't think that's cooperation. Because the dog didn't move? No, no, no. I, They're I still hunting for the gun, but your gun's on horseback. Well, you're, yeah, but you're so far away. You know, there's a... That goes into, like... I don't... You think you're going to get an email from... <laughs> from you think you're going to get an don't email... Don't give out my contact of, information from, after from this. Tug of War. You think you're going to get an email about Tug of War. I'm going to get an email because, like, I've hunted in big country, and I know there's dogs that hunt at 400 yards away. Mm-hmm. And a dog goes on point, and you go over there, and everything works good, and you get your bird. I don't want a dog 400 yards away. It's like, I just don't. But that's probably because the bulk of my hunting is in the grouse woods. Right. I don't want to fight my way through that much bramble and briar. Yep. I want a dog that's... Nor would those... Birds hold for that dog. Uh, very unlikely. I mean, unless he's good, right? Um, what else can we bend bend the rules on here? So tug of war, mm-hmm. pro for me, <laughs> cooperation. But all right, how about when you get a new dog? Mm-hmm. You got a couple last year, right? Puppies, yeah. Puppies. Mm-hmm. The Vishla was one of them. This the one. two Vishlas, yeah. And the other Vishla is. She's trialing. She's trialing right now. Mm-hmm. What did you see that made you think, like, oh, I think that's a good idea? Or did somebody just talk you into it? How did, how did that happen? The puppies? Yeah. No, ultimately I wanted to breed my male Vishla, who's no longer with me, mm-hmm. to, to her. I wanted to do it right. Yeah. Go through all the health certificates, everything, yep. whatever the breeder wanted me to do with the dog. Um, prove the dog that right. it was, it could be bred and it was the right dog to be bred. Right. Um, what was the question? 
<laughs> Sorry. When, <laughs> God, you only had... I know. One, what is two? That? Hawks, Columbus, Dead and Buried? It was pretty good. I've just <laughs> tried it. Okay. You had those two puppies. Oh, right, the puppies. Right. So what made one come with you and one stay with a, a trailer? The, the personality of it. I, I saw, I, yeah, I saw a little bit more independence. independence. Okay, mm -hmm. right. Um, she wanted to range a little farther. Bigger range, mm -hmm. yep. Um, the noses were both there. I would say the cooperation was both there. Mm -hmm. they, if I turned around, they'd go back with me. But you just saw more go, more run, more run. Bit, run, yeah. more run. Mm -hmm. Um, then how I, did you find a trailer that did that? The like, breeder. Through the breeder, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to networking and doing Correct. all your... Yeah. And that goes back to like all the new people who probably could do more of that. Networking? Networking and researching. Yes. And it's pretty easy these days. Educating yourself. Yeah, yeah. It is. It's super easy. With all the content, there's YouTube videos, there's podcasts. Mm -hmm. Um the tough thing is sorting through it all. Yeah. And what's going to work for you and what's not going to work right. for you. Almost like, even if you hear it, doesn't mean it's what you should do, but you should hear it. Right. You should you should hear it and you're like, yeah, that's not for me. Or, ooh, that might be for me. You right. Know? It, it's, it's such a tough road. Uh, you know, my first dog, are you, are you good on time? We're good. Um, my first dog, I can't count with JD. He, he was not very good. My first good dog that I bought, you mm -hmm. know, I literally taught her to go in the dog box and taught her to hunt, and it was all just there. Mm -hmm. There was like literally no training. But it, it almost went to like the first time I put her on a leash, she pulled, I pulled back. She's like, oh, well, I guess I shouldn't pull on a leash. And you, you kind of have that philosophy too. I don't teach them to heal. I just teach them to be good on a leash. Right. It's the same thing, right? but it's not formal. But then there's dogs that just go like, oh, I guess I shouldn't pull on a right. leash. You know? Um, she just, I could hunt her anywhere. Hunt her in the prairies, hunt her in the woods. Mm -hmm. Now, she wasn't going to go 400 yards. Right. She, For a short hair, I thought it was pretty cool. She literally casted like a, like a, just. Some dogs just we had, have it. Yeah, I know, isn't it? Like, if there was three guys hunting a field, a CRP field, mm -hmm. she kind of went out to Spank. that guy's left, turned around, went to the guy on the right, and that's how this dog hunted. The, like, if we were running west, she, runned, she ran north to south X amount of yards mm -hmm. until we got to where we were going, and we turned the direction. Like, I didn't do anything to make that dog do that. Mm -hmm. So, was that... That might have been cooperation. That might have been natural cooperation. Right. But to not even ever have that, she never had that wild hair like, oh, I'm going to take a line. She never even took a line. You know, it was always like, ex it was like, if I could clone that dog. Might be a little bit of genetics playing right, in there. Right. Um, we kind of talked about that with the pointers and the, yeah. some, the pointers that could stand the higher steadiness and the pointers are like, oh, I'll, I'll do what you say, but. Some dogs want to retrieve or they want to chase more, where other dogs get that high on just finding the bird and going and standing there and breathing it all in. And that's their. Ooh. That's it. Yeah. That's their dopamine release. Right. And the other ones need a little more. Or, yeah. Why do you like smoking cigars? Oh, it's, it's addictive. It's right? so good. You want one? I, <laughs> I can take one. <laughs> Not opposed to it. So, I want to go back to, again, you're getting a new puppy. You do your research. You picked up two Vichla puppies, mm -hmm. Iowa. Mm -hmm. um, I was only supposed to get one. Right. But you got two. Mm -hmm. You got this cocker chunk. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at another cocker. I'm going to pick up another Vishla. And another? You from, the, from the breeder. I'm actually taking his fail out. So. When you say fail out, a dog that's not going to trial, you think? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we had actually picked up this puppy, supposed to be a stud dog. Mm hmm. And we picked him up in 
Montana when we were stationed in Idaho and brought okay. him back yep. to the breeder, um, to Cody. Just because we built that relationship, we were coming back through anyway. Right, and that guy said, you know, it's not what I'm looking for for that venue. He, he put that dog through the same trialer and the same everything as my dog went through. Mm -hmm. His dog, for whatever reason, would go out come back and check in. Right. That's not what you want for right. a horseback field trial. So instead of trying to change that dog as a natural. Right. He said this the, the uh, field trialer said, look, don't don't waste your money. Right. He's either not there yet or he's not gonna play right. this game. It's like a shot put thrower and a distance runner. <laughs> right. I mean, why why force your dog into something when he plays a better game at basketball than he does right, soccer? Right, exactly. So... That's another problem new people have. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah. after Digit had died... Um, that was your first feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cody and I were talking, and he said, this, he's not exactly what I want for my dog. Right. Breedable, everything. He's got similar lines. Right. So I'm taking him on. He's going to be part of my string because right. that's what I need. Right. I need the dog to not go far and check in for my job. Right. So it fit. Right. Fit for you. Mm hmm But it was going to be his dog originally. Right. Right. And I think people will be surprised at how much that, in the, I don't want to say the professional level, but the trial world, the test world, how much that happens. You said Chunk is going to probably go to somebody. Yeah, I will probably. Which makes me cry. You want to buy him? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Because he's a good dog. He is a very good dog. He's only six or seven months old. Well, yeah, when I saw that dog, I said, that's the biggest cocker. He's probably about as big as what Taffy was, right? Oh, not he's a little. way bigger than Taffy. Is he bigger than Taffy? And I'm like. He's going to be I, huge. He's going to be. He's, he's six be months huge. old. He's the size of a Springer. I know. But, you know, Springers and Cockers came from the same right. stuff. So he just got that one gene that's got some leg to Dad it. Dad wasn't even that, that big no, either. No, you said you know both of the parents. Yeah. Are we getting the correction here? Yeah. Well, we got a digger? We're digging. Uh oh, who's digging? Get the right dog. Oh, you got the right dog. Yeah, we just toned. And that's the. Hey, let's wrap it up on tone. Okay. Um, that's a thing that's a I don't want to say controversy how do you incorporate tone for behavior what it really boils down to is tone avoidance um, I will tone my dogs for recall is what it ends up being okay. um, now my dogs do they wait let me interrupt mm -hmm. do they think that a nick from the collar is coming next Yes. Oh, okay. That is tone okay. avoidance. Okay. All because right. Because they know something is coming after. Okay. You just lay down. Right, right. <laughs> I can't look over my shoulder, right. but I saw him quit. Mm -hmm. He and quit. That was just a he tone. stopped. Now he's, now he's laying down. That's not a vibrate. That's a tone. Just no, a that's tone. Like little. Right. But I will start my dogs with a tone for recall. So Chunk is not collar conditioned yet, the cock. Mm -hmm. I will tone with a long lead on and use leash pressure to come come in and pair it with the tone to come in yes right. um, so it's just overlaying a language right and yeah. once we understand yes okay tone means I'm gonna come to you and I'm gonna get so much praise right when I know for a fact that that dog knows what a tone means to come back mm -hmm. I will start incorporating pressure when he starts to make wrong decisions and it just resonates with the mercy. You just like so oh. they know that they love putting those collars on. They do. I mm -hmm. can touch the collars in the camper. I could. They're like goody goody goody. I don't have to yeah. take it off the clip. I can jingle the metal part, mm -hmm. and they all come running because yeah. they know they get to go out. Right. But they also know that whatever comes from the collar comes from me. It's not the collar, it's me. Right. And I think that's where we get confusion in some of the there, people, there too. Prob there probably should be somebody that does a video that just goes into the weeds with the collar. 
collars and conditioning. Well, totally. there's different ways to use a collar, right, too. Right, right. And a lot of people, you know, there was an old saying back in the day. I didn't make it up, but I read it in an article. Giving a collar to a new dog owner is like giving a monkey a switchblade. Yeah. They're like, ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> They're just swinging it, right? And like, oh, that worked. I'll use it all the time. Right. That's, that's, uh, so do you use vibrate at all or just tone? Not really, no. Yeah. I, I don't use vibrate. Um, but it could be incorporated, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's just another. If I would use a vibrate, I think I would use it more as a disruptor. For You're just mousing I, around or something. Yeah, maybe. I don't want you to do that. And they feel like, it's a, mm. yeah. Yeah. What, like, what okay. the heck was that? Yeah, what the heck was that? So it's not using the training, it's just using like a little, ah. Right. Like you would do a dog grabbing something you don't want. Ah, ah, don't. Right. So you use the, the vibrate for that, yeah. But, I mean. Most of the time, I, I, I usually don't even have the setting onto a vibrate. What are you it's, using there? What is it? This is the two, uh, Alpha 200. 200. I do have a 550 plus. For, would you use a 550 plus for like yard training? And yes. Regular, yeah. Exactly. Because that, that. That when is, I'm really trying to accomplish something. Right, right. Then you want a, tra a true training collar. Yes. Right, and that's just everything. You can... This is, yeah, this is everything. So what the 550 plus does is you allows you to go up in levels incrementally. Right. And you got to set pace. that. you got to set that. One. Right. But for what they're doing. Yeah. You just said, hey. Right. Knock, knock it off, but you can still sit here and drink a whatever that thing is. Yes. And the dog quit. Yeah. Oh, wait, I'm going to turn around and look. Yep, he quit. He did. Mm -hmm. Look at them dogs. Except yeah. except Chunk is trying to get Tagus to turn I over. think your dog might have started that. Oh, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> bullshit. Tagus is... Oh, yeah, I get, maybe he is. <laughs> huh? What? You said my name? And look at the other ones. They're like... Uh, you know what? Let's wrap it up with... I, I keep saying wrap it up. Let's wrap it up with the chain gang. Okay, you're perfect. Isn't that... I mean... I love it. And you said... I said, oh, Jill, you don't need to do it. Say, you're so used to doing it wherever you go. Right. And you didn't when I met you the first time at training grounds in, in Michigan. It, it's so foundational that, like, you wouldn't even think of not doing it. Right. Like, I told you, you could put them up in the kennel. I was like, no, I'm going to put them on a chain gang in, in the shade. You're not going to put them out in 90 degree no, sun. Yeah. But the behavior you get from the dogs, that is one of the things that dogs will kind of learn from other dogs. I, I would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. They yank, they pull, and the other dogs, the, the senior dogs, aren't yanking and pulling, and they kind of be like, I, I guess we're just gonna wait a little bit. Right. Which goes back to the tie out stake, mm -hmm. and goes back to the calming touch, mm -hmm. and goes back to foundation. So we probably expedited Tangus's learning curve. Oh my God, you're probably gonna send me an invoice. That's right. Just for setting up that chain game. <laughs> all right, Jill, we could do this all day, but. Um, we can't. Next time, uh, where's the next time? Where, where are we going to meet again? I don't know. Uh, well, after Pennsylvania. You're going to Pennsylvania. Well, I'm in Wisconsin for a week. Who are you going to see in Wisconsin? I am going to check out more Wild Rose stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're, and Wild Rose is down south, but they, they put clinics on. Their original site, I guess, was Oxford, and now they mm -hmm. have many locations. There's okay. a Texas, a North Carolina. They're doing the Midwest, I think. I don't know what the Wisconsin... Wisconsin might be the Widmes. Okay. Mi yeah. Midwest location. It might have a different name. Right. And what will you do when you go there? Because I think a Wild Rose is labs, all labs. Oh. Yeah. Um, I am... I'm going to see how they really start or background their, their okay. puppies. I might... Get you're into like a, it, I might not. You're not only a gear junkie, you're a training junkie. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you you just want to keep, you want to see what everybody does and find out what, what the, works for you. The more you know, the more you learn. And not everyone knows everything. I'm taking a, I could take a bit from you, a bit from Justin. Yeah, yeah. a bit from a test day. A bit sure. From, so from Wisconsin, then where? Iowa. Iowa, back to where you went back last year. Back to the breeder. Year. Mm -hmm. We'll and be then, there then for you're going to end up going all the way to Idaho or Colorado and Idaho. Colorado. Mm -hmm. We'll train with Mike Stewart again, and I'll probably climb some mountains. Oh, good for you, young person. Mm -hmm. and Both sets of worst <laughs> thing in the world. <laughs> and then back to Idaho, and then we're going to finish up in Oklahoma with an advanced seminar with Ronnie Smith. Oh, cool. Yeah. 
Let me tell you a little something about hiking in mountains. You're way younger than me. You are going to regret every mountain you climb when you're my age. Now, I'm going to be dead and gone, but if there's a heaven and I see you looking down and you're still running dogs when you're in your 60s and your knees hurting and your ankles are hurting, I'm going to go, I told you, running up mountains is bad behavior. I don't run. Well, walking. We weren't meant to. You know what the mountains are for? Pine trees. And porcupines. <laughs> and porcupines, right. They're not meant for dogs and humans. <laughs> but anyway, Jill, it's been a great it's been great. I, I love having you come on and I enjoy it. The fact that you were in the valley and we got to bullshit like this. Yeah. Um, and I think somebody might even gain a little especially a newbie. That's your big concern. You you work with a lot of you 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 it's not something you do for a living, but it's a you want people to realize that like Get more information, find out, read more, don't lock into anything. Right. And, you know, take away, like, I think everybody's take away with works, but don't do one thing and just expect it to work. Right. And you've learned that in a relatively short period of time. I, I think I've expedited my learning curve, too. Good deal. Are you heading back to Roanoke? Yes, I am. All right. That's it. Thanks That's for it, boys and me. girls. Say goodnight, Joe. Good night.